So what we needed was, uh, it seemed to me, we needed a model where, where we could dispense with the behaviour. And that's when I began to think whether, whether we or, or try to think of a, a different model and I began to, to explore the issue of thinking about the movements rather than doing them. And it did a series of experiments which were amongst the first, uh, if not the first, to look at the whole issue of preparing to make a movement, imagining the movement, and executing the movement. And again, the results were quite stunning because all this folklore about pianists imagining their concerts while they're preparing for them, or tennis players imagining their backhanders in order to improve their function, absolutely true. If you imagine making this movement with your hand, you light up all the areas in the brain that are lit up by making the movement except for the final area in the motor cortex which sends the signals out. It sends them out from here, which is the motor cortex, down through this part of the brain, the stem of the brain, out to the muscles. So everything here was preparing you for the movement, but the final signal into the motor cortex, firing out to the muscles, was not there until you actually did the movement. There are very important parts here, the so-called dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. Great interest also to Chris Frith. They were very important in initiating action. Free will, if you like. And Chris started talking about the physiology of free will, or perhaps some of us did at any rate. Then there were these areas of the brain, the premotor cortex, which were involved in elaborating motor programs for complex movements. There was the motor cortex itself. There were parts in the parietal lobe, which we've already talked about, behind the motor cortex, that were involved in receiving information about how the movement was going ahead and programming its parameters in space. All these components, together with other parts deep in the brain, the basal ganglia, parts of which we've already discussed in relation to Huntington's and Parkinson's disease, how this system within the brain worked. And that was an extremely exciting time, a lot of very basic physiology, if you like, a physiology which had not really been described before in relation to human behavior, and it allowed us to start thinking biologically about things such as uh, how do you initiate an action? How do you attend to an action? Do you know that if you practice your backhand fantastically well, so you've got a brilliant backhand, and then during the tennis match someone asks you to attend to your backhand whilst you're, your, your game disintegrates? Um, it's, it's, there are all sorts of fascinating behavioural quirks like that which began to be explained in terms of the physiology of the motor system. <laughs> ¶¶